all the participants, the speaker from uh, uh, South Africa. So uh, I'm just welcoming the, all of you uh, for this third webinar on legal education and social justice. And uh, when we talk uh, social justice, when we talk uh, legal education, one thing which is like uh, always uh, taking the mind of our is like uh, social justice uh, is like one of the parameters through which uh, uh, means legal education can bring all these sort of things. And with that particular note, I welcome all of you for this uh, third webinar. Uh, that's a collaboration of uh, Institute of Law, Nirma University and Faculty of Law, uh, University of Johannesburg. And uh, now I would like to introduce uh, uh, one of the discussions, Shrishiv uh, Reddy. Professor Shrishiv Reddy is uh, admitted attorney of High Court of South Africa. Mr. Reddy has uh, lecturing commercial law at University of Johannesburg for past seven years. He is currently pursuing uh, an LLD in cyber law. His field of interest include commercial law, cyber law, with the key focus on uh, social media and artificial intelligence. So I'll welcome uh, you, Professor Reddy. And uh, uh, this particular webinar definitely going to bring a lot many perspective to all of us. So over to you, uh, Professor Reddy. Thank you so much, Arpit. Uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Arpit Sharma, who is going to be the theme coordinator and is also one of the discussants for today's seminar. Mr. Arpit Sharma is an assistant professor at the Institute of Law, Nirma University, where he teaches labor law and real estate law. He is pursuing his doctoral studies from Gujarat National University, Gandhinagar, on a critical review of corporate social responsibilities and non-financial disclosure in environment vis-a-vis -vis environmental problems in India. His areas of interest are labor law and corporate governance. So Arpit and myself will be discussing in today's seminar. I now have the pleasure of also introducing uh, Megan Quinn. She is one of the collaboration coordinators uh, for the series seminars. Megan Finn is a lecturer in the Department of Public Law at the University of Johannesburg and an editor of the Constitutional Court Review. Megan holds a BSOC Science degree honors and LLB degree from the University of Cape Town, as well as a BCL degree from the University of Oxford. Currently, she is a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Witwatersrand. Megan has also served as a law clerk of the Constitutional Court and is an admitted advocate of the High Court of South Africa. She previously practiced at the Johannesburg Bar and appeared as counsel in a number of reported judgments, including of the Constitutional Court. So I'll hand over to Megan to give a few words. Thank you so much, Sir. So welcome colleagues, esteemed presenters, students and all who are joining us today. It's really a pleasure to welcome you all to our third seminar. This collaboration, which is Social Justice Continuum in India and South Africa, has been a collaboration that we've been working on throughout this year. Both India and South Africa are marred by legacies of colonialism uh, and deep injustices and abiding inequalities. And both uh, have what, what uh, constitutions that aim to be transformative, but where even some of the progressive guarantees that are set out in, in constitutions and legislative frameworks often fall short uh, in terms of what's, what the lived realities on the grounds are. So the collaboration is really exploring those themes. Um, we have four seminars. This is our third one, which we're really excited about today. Our first seminar was on equality and anti-discrimination law in both jurisdictions, specifically looking at LGBTIQ plus communities, legal victories and lived realities and the extent to which lived realities, there is a disjuncture between uh, the victories on paper and lived realities in practice. We also considered both jurisdictions commitments to see law. That was our first seminar. Our second seminar was about burgeoning themes in labor law. So specifically emerging forms of work and informalization. Uh, and then the position of vulnerable workers, vulnerable laborers, um, particularly in light of the pressures that climate change places on the workforce. Today's seminar is on legal education, and we're really, really looking forward to hearing our speakers explore different dimensions of legal education from a kind of overarching philosophical framework to tracing how legal education plays out in pre-pre- uh, pre 
university levels, uh, then within the university curriculum, and then finally looking forward, the kinds of social imperatives that, uh, that law students bring to bear once they enter the world of practice. Our fourth seminar is at, on the 20th of November, and that will really be looking at emerging technologies uh, and the law. So all of these seminars really look at the possibility of social justice and law as a lever of social change, and the extent to which law can operate at the, as that lever and sometimes fall short. We're really excited for today's seminar. Uh, it's really looking at the possibility and pitfalls of a social justice infused legal education. So thank you all for joining today. Really happy to see all of, all of, all of your faces uh, on the side of my screen. Uh, and one final thing from me before I hand over is if we could please ask, I'm going to share a, a um, URL in the chat box please could we ask, especially all students who are joining us today, both uh, from Nima University and from India and from South Africa, to please fill in that Google form. It'll take one minute only. We need that for our internal reporting purposes. That's it from me. Thank you so much again, everyone who's joined today and to all of our speakers and discussants and looking forward to a really thought-provoking uh, seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, for those words. Um, I will now have the pleasure of introducing our speakers for today's seminar. I will introduce all four speakers as well as their titles, and I will thereafter quickly give you a brief bio note of each speaker, and then I'll hand over to the speakers to conduct their presentations. So our first speaker today is Prof. Bakshi. He will be speaking about how to make legal juristic learning, teaching, thinking, and writing more democratic in a neoliberal era. Professor Bakshi is an eminent law jurist and a professor emeritus at the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom. Um, he was awarded the Padma Shri, the fourth highest award in India by the government of India. He has been the vice chancellor of the University of Delhi during 1990 and 1994, and the vice chancellor of the University of South Gujarat, Surat. India during 1982 and 1985. He has taught various courses at several international universities, including Sydney, Duke, American, and at national law schools in India. Prof. Bakshi's areas of special expertise in teaching and research include comparative constitutionalism, social theory of human rights, uh, responsibilities in corporate governance and business conduct, and materiality of globalization. He is celebrated by his students, which is always a nice thing, who have started a website archiving all his publications. Thereafter, after Prof. Bakshi, we will have our second speaker, which will be Dr. Anzani Muyai, who will be presenting on foundational education as a contributor towards social justice. Dr. Muyai is a lecturer at the University of Johannesburg. She completed her LLB at the University of Vienna in 2014 and proceeded to complete her LLM in international criminal law at the Northwest University Mafikeng campus in 2015. As a Pan-African, she is an advocate for the unity amongst Africans and the development of Africa as reflected in her work. This leads her to complete her PhD at the Northwest University Mafikeng campus in public law with her research interests focusing on finding solutions to the corruption problem in Africa, which in 2020 was converted to a book. Our third speaker and following from Dr. Munyai's uh, presentation will be Professor Pradeep Karyal. She will be presenting on Nurturing CHAMP, which stands for Creative, Holistic, Altruistic, Maverick Problem Solvers, Lawyers Through Adaptive Clinical Andragogy. Prof is the founding dean, School of Law, Forensic Justice and Policy Studies, Gandhi Nagar. She has been a director and dean of the Institute of Law, Nirma University since 2010. Prof was with the Senior Social Scientist Award by the Indian Society of Criminology for a significant contribution to the field of criminology. She has been actively engaged in the institution building and the clinical legal education processes, as well as an active member of the Global Alliance for Justice Education and South Asian Network for Justice Education. Her areas of specialization are criminal justice studies, justice education, higher education, pedagogy, and assessment for teaching. 
She has been a consultant and resource person on various aspects of legal studies for government and non-government organizations. In trained on education pedagogy for various national and international law teachers, training programs, and conferences. And then our final speaker will be Dr. Michelle van Eck, who will be speaking on legal education and ethics, the road towards social justice. Dr. Van Eck is an admitted attorney of the High Court of South Africa, non-practicing, and a senior lecturer in the University of Johannesburg, um, uh, the Department of Private Law. She currently teaches the undergraduate uh, law of contract module and postgraduate modules of law and language and drafting of contracts that forms part of the LLM in drafting and interpretation of contracts. Her research interests include contract law, drafting of contracts, legal education, and legal ethics. She is also one of the recipients of the University of Johannesburg's Vice Chancellor's Most Promising Young Teacher Award in 2020. So we look forward to all our speakers presenting. Each speaker will have 20 minutes to present their papers. Um, should you have any questions, please utilize the chat box that we have there. Only the speakers will have their videos and their, their sound on. Um, we will only address the questions at the end of all four speakers. So please don't think that we are ignoring your question. We will get to it at the end. And um, we will take everything as it comes. Alfred, I'm not sure if you want to say anything else before I hand over to Prof. Bakshi. No, only if uh, there is any question, then please post it to me or uh, uh, to uh, Shirshif. Uh, so we will take up at the end of the uh, last 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Arpit. Prof. Bakshi will hand over to you to deliver your presentation. Thank you very much, dear friends. Uh, Arpit, Sarvashiv, Megan, Varsha, Purvi, distinguished participants from Nirma and uh, Johannesburg faculty, and um, gentle persons. I say gentle persons instead of uh, men and women. Ladies and gentlemen, which is a very sexist way of speaking. Gentle persons are all friends or potential friends. I'm sorry, I have no access to, um, I know nothing about this technology. And therefore, I don't know, I can't operate the checkbox. So if there are any questions directed to me, I think you will have to transfer them to me somehow. I know time is a great limitation. Um, but I must say one thing before I get to the subject, namely, uh, Varsha has done me honor by uh, inscribing in my synopsis that I'm eminent something, uh, something, legal education or something. The word eminent, I recall me uh, what Justice Krishna wrote to me when I first became the Vice Chancellor of South Sudan University. And he said, you are now an eminent edu educationist. And Krishna had always had uh, sting in his tail. And second paragraph, he said, uh, well, but congratulations, but remember Bernard Shaw, who said, and I quote Krishna Iyer and Shaw together, who said that the more eminent a person is, the more things she has done to be ashamed of. So welcome to this great company of eminent people. You are truly eminent. I'm talking about eminent as applied to me. Um, I find it impossible to cover all the themes I've uh, laid out in a short synopsis. And I will not do that in 20 minutes' time. Uh, what I am uh, particularly concerned is to speak about one of the several Ds of uh, neoliberalism. And neoliberalism itself is a continent of contested concepts. I'm particularly interested in the Ds which I mentioned in paragraph one of the synopsis, which are a mouthful denationalization, disinvestment, deregulation, dejudification, depolitization, de-democratization. And now there's a third and then a last de-edit by queer and feminist, post-feminist theory, I beg your pardon, which um, 
calls uh, a, a last D called D solid, solidarization, negation of solidarity, the privatization of individual rights. So I will not deal with this riot of meanings that uh, several Ds express, but this is my way of understanding neoliberalism. My way of stop using the word, by the way, raise the legal education and research. Um, and uh, there is a very nice name given by Porvi uh, to the, what's it called, CHEMP or something, uh, which we'll talk about. But I call legal education now uh, uh, my acronym, uh, which is uh, by Buximoron, like Oxymoron. My Buximoron is uh, learning, teaching, thinking, and writing, LTTW formation. That's what, so I'm concerned with no matter how much neoliberalism degrades the university education, I'm not concerned in, in this presentation because there's no time. I'm not concerned with curriculum, syllabus, and pedagogy issues. Again, in this presentation, I'm concerned only with how to bring the contours and contradictions of neoliberalism, which I shall hereafter call NL, NL into L, T, T, W. That's a short question. Because we have to teach law. We have to teach something or co learn it, as I fancy. And I think I'll only begin and end with one D. All these are related. And all these are the final D is devastation. I'm not included so far because I don't speak to the future. It's for you to live in the future. So essentially, as to the deregulation, they are our cousins of each other, but they are autonomous of each other. They're interdependent of each other. Each other. On depoliticization, this also tongue twisters, DP, DP. DP, there were three approaches. One, uh, one approach takes you is an ostrich like that will be unfair to ostrich in the morning, in the afternoon, sorry. It's a bit wrong, but one has to be unfair to somebody or somewhere. Therefore, we take ostrich. Ostriches are supposed to bury their heads in the sands when they see the portents of the storm and, and emerge when all is over, the tempest is over. I think this attitude is very fatal to um, LTTW. Um, it is the um, most pernicious, if not fatal, and it is equally pernicious and fatal to the th three prudences that we live under, namely legislators, the prudence of the legislature, jurisprudence, the first principles of law that you think we know, but we don't, it takes a lifetime to find out that we don't. That we left jurisprudence as if we knew them. And then the Mosprudence, which is a Buxiborn also, it's a new addition to the, to the pantheon of prudences under which we live. Um, one may take a second approach, and this is a typical law teacher's approach, forgive me, a present company excluded. Uh, and soon they put on the one and on the other end. On the one hand, it is good. On the other hand, it is, it is deficient. On the one hand, it is X. On, one, on the other hand, it is Y or X minus. I think that is uh, not relevant. Essentially, that escapes the contradictory unity that any mode of production brings. And therefore, I deal with... Uh, depolitization in three ways in relation to neoliberalism. First is privatization. It is deeply related to privatization. Matters which ought to be public are rendered private. This is extraordinary, but it's true. We live in those times. And now that Joe, they decision to decriminalize homosexuality and gay and lesbian relations, many of gender justice issues, privatization 
is a virtue of markets and industries. So much so our category called trade-related market-friendly human rights. Everything becomes trade-related market-friendly. Regulation itself becomes trade-related market-friendly. And therefore, privatization prevents us from looking at the deep structure of inequalities in this society. It takes out our mind. Some people have got rights, so you should get right. I'm not against it, I'm, I'm for it. I'm for, for it. I'm saying the overall effect of privatization with the hobby horse of ne neoliberalism is privatization. Matters which ought to be in the public realm are met, become matters of private rights. Um, and second thing is, liberation is thought to be achieved, but only through capitalism, not through any other model of production. So there is, a, as you know, um, a TINA factor operating. In you know, TINA means there is no other alternative. And no pastry and the last man, as Sokoyama said. So the, take concrete example. We have won a lot of, we have struggled very hard and won a lot of victories for gender justice, equality of women. Absolutely necessary. Every generation must fight for it. We must all fight for it. But if you look at it deeply, what it means is confirmation of certain rights of women as against men in terms of equality. But relegation of a inequity and injustice in the private sphere. You can break the glass ceiling in the public sphere by special affirmative action or reservation or whatever, or compensatory uh, discrimination. But what happens in private sector, in the private social life, civil society, is only marginally touched by the state and the market. So that is a, I wouldn't have generalized, I would say this is a, currently privatization is related, uh, neoliberalism is related to what is called autocratic legality. And autocratic legality is, as I said earlier, and this is a uh, screw summation, uh, but as I said earlier, two things. One is anonymization. It's not a D, but it's a denaming, anonymization, if you like. And second is desolidarization. And it's a matter of social movement becomes a matter of individual mobility in the market. So that the structural issues are of thought. Um, there is a very nice, and now end, a very, very good, um, good, um, not two, two minutes, uh, a very nice uh, uh, contribution made by deep feminist theory and queer theory to the whole idea, liberal idea of equality and neoliberal liberal idea of structural equity. And I don't have time, but the taken, they were asked the question, why sexual minorities' rights are enunciated in neoliberal times? And the last two paragraphs of my synopsis, and summarizing all of them here, is that this is a buy-in of civic loyalty by the state and the market. Give people more rights, give them more identity, avoid the stigma and discrimination against them. The flip side of that, this is already good, this must be done. The flip side of that is support our policy against migrants. So the same people who ask sexual freedom for themselves, deny migrant rights for the state and the market. Fairly popular, the ideal case mentioned in literature is Germany. There are many other societies. So I will end now with scattered remarks and buximorons. I'll attend, I'll attend, end by saying the question before LTTW is 
how to reverse Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci said, we must possess optimism of will and pessimism of intellect and confronting crisis of hegemony. How does legal education so-called reverse it? I think it tries to reverse it by saying, pessimism with will is required in neoliberal times. And optimism of the intellect is required in this time. So we need to down here. I suppose I'll end here and then uh, if anything at all is communicated anywhere, uh, any comments or questions, I'll be happy to fill them. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Bakshi. We will be taking questions at the end once all the presenters have, have made their, their uh, presentations. Uh, we will inform you if there are any questions and we will direct them to you. I'll move over to our second speaker, Dr. Munyai. So Dr. Munyai, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Mr. Reddy. Um, firstly, I'd like to apologize for um, not being able to enable my video. My camera is not working. So in the meantime, I'm just going to share my presentation. I hope everyone can see it. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, before I start my presentation to Prof. Bachi for a very interesting um, presentation. I do hope mine will be as um, interesting. Um, I also want to thank Megan and also Prof. Vasha for the opportunity as well. So as you can see here on the slide, my topic or the topic of my presentation is pre-law education as an apparatus to combat corruption and promote um, social justice. So before I start with my presentation, I'd actually like to pose two questions. Um, so the first one is, how did we get to a point to learn to say thank you or to learn to say please? Um, how did we get to a point of knowing that when we work hard, we will be rewarded for it? So as I move forward with my presentation, I want you to think about these questions because they will be crucial when I lay out my hypothesis. So before I tend to the core of my presentation, it is imperative to perhaps provide an overview on the importance of learning and its role in behavior and consequences. So Lenchman noted that most textbooks um, definition of learning refers to learning as a change in behavior that is due to experience. So though this perspective is general, it essentially means that learning is seen as a function that maps experiences onto behavior. In other words, learning is defined as an effect of experience on behavior. If this is the perspective, then one would essentially need to focus on how to stimulate this behavior in an attempt to yield or to shape certain consequences. For example, if a teacher compliments a student for good marks or an improvement, the student is most likely going to perform better or to rather work hard. If we agree on this, couldn't the same be said when we teach pupils about ethics in an attempt to yield consequences of creating a society that promotes social justice? When this is applied in the context of education, it becomes apparent that education as a process of facilitating learning involves the acquisition of knowledge, skills, values, beliefs, and habits. So education is one of the most important indicators of development because it increases an individual's capacity to make informed decisions and is a tool for social change as well. So global advancement is inevitable. And as a result, cultures, human behaviors, social institutions and structures are bound to experience change. So the inevitable transformation of a society, a country or a continent determines its success and failure. So in order to prevent the latter, society's perspective of life and social order has to be developed in order to build opinions and the ability to make informed decisions. 
So the primary reason why learners go to school is to ensure that they receive quality education in an effort to prepare them to proceed to higher learning institutions should they wish to do so, and also to assist them through life in general. So the same can be the motivation why pre-law education should be introduced in school curriculums. This will have an impact on those <clears throat> who, for example, intend to pursue law degrees as the field of studies. Furthermore, the introduction of legal principles, ethics, and theory um, of law in South African schools will ensure that learners be better law-abiding citizens who appreciate every essence of social um, justice. So with that in mind, the focus of this presentation is to illustrate the reality that corruption weakens the pillars of social justice centered on the concept of fairness um, among people within society intended to ensure that everyone has equal access to opportunities, wealth, health, etc., irrespective of their legal, political, economic, or other circumstances. So essentially, corruption is embedded in the social fabric irrespective of whether a person perceives corruption as immoral or acceptable, the bottom line is that it promotes private gains in isolation or at the expense of others, and as a result, jeopardizing democratic principles, promoting unethical behavior, and also inequality. So to address these issues, the argument here in a nutshell is that education can actually play a role or has a role to play in addressing the corruption conundrum and the promotion of social justice. As I mentioned earlier, a deliberate systematic plan is required and education, in my opinion, is that plan or solution. So the eradication of corruption and the promotion of social justice may be discharged through pre-law teaching of citizenship, education, and teachings on democratic principles and constitutionalism, um, and most importantly, teachings on ethics and also integrity as well. All of this is in an attempt to preserve principles of social justice and ensure that they are embedded within society. So how do we achieve all of this? We need to revise our school curriculums. Ultimately, in the context of legal education, pre-law education will essentially be a necessary foundation also for individuals who intend to be um, law professionals. So with the introduction um, out of the way, perhaps let me provide a general basis of social justice and why it is important. So the United Nations broadly understands social justice as a fair and compassionate distribution of fruits and also economic growth. Political instability together with colonial heritage appears to be a strong determinant of corruption. In other words, social justice requires that individuals have the opportunity and platform to participate in making the policies that affect their well-being. So among other features of social justice and also for the sake of time, I will explain a few in an attempt to highlight the fact that the existence of corruption affects the essence of social justice. So these features, for instance, are equity and also access to resources. So corruption ensures that there is an equal access and fair deployment of wealth and also regarding access to resources and in the context of those in power, Corruption is the misuse of <coughs> trust funds for private gains, meaning any chance of having fair distribution of resources or state resources or funds is hindered by the mere existence of um, corruption. So I refer to corruption as an invisible enemy amongst human beings. One may ask whose enemy exactly? So surely we can agree that not the enemy of those benefiting from it, but instead the enemy of everyone deprived of social economic development. No doubt corruption undermines morals and ethical principles, subsequently hindering the advancement of people's quality of life. This is because corruption has become part of the social fabric. In other words, it is so common that it has become a way of life. So we often use the term um, when we are of the view that being deprived of what is rightfully ours or when we don't get proper service um, delivery. Now, irrespective of how one views it, there is no watertight 
um, definition of corruption. Why? Because it means different things to different people. But for the sake of being general, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines corruption as a dishonest or illegal behavior, especially by powerful people. So two things, in my opinion, are apparent from this definition. The first one is the element of power. It is that element is it's, it's obvious in the definition and it is associated with those in power. So what is interesting is that in reality, the ordinary citizens, depending on a particular situation, may have power over individuals in power. Therefore, this suggests that um, the perpetration of corruption can be um, uh, um, um, perpetrated by those in power and also um, ordinary citizens in general. So it is true that corruption takes different forms and irrespective of the form, it may be agreed that individuals um, who engage in corruption or those who are being deprived of it are actually um, being put in a position where they are not getting as much opportunities as they're entitled or resources that they are entitled to. So I acknowledge that there are numerous measures, anti-corruption measures in place to combat corruption, of course, yet it still exists. No doubt the existence of political will plays a role in its eradication. I therefore argue that to attain this political will, individuals need to appreciate the essence of social justice. And to appreciate this, you need to learn about it, hence the element of pre-law education. This will ensure that the entire society is engraved with the need to respect democracy, democratic principles, to respect the constitution, and um, to accept or to appreciate the ethical obligations to follow certain course of actions. So with the corruption and social justice perspective put in place, I would like to proceed to introduce the element of pre-law um, education in the equation. So legal education plays a role in ensuring law students fulfill their different roles in society and also producing lawyers with a social vision. It is primarily focused to individuals who intend to become legal professionals. Now, one of the central arguments of this paper is that the exposure of the law should not be limited to those in higher learning institutions. The primary purpose of legal education should be broader than simply training lawyers or, for example, those who aspire to have law degrees for entrepreneurial purposes, for instance. Pre-law education should be perceived as a system that encourages and enables citizens to be law-abiding citizens, cultivating human values and rights together with ethical um, principles. So what I believe to be true is that pre-law education has a role to play in the eradication of corruption and also the promotion of social justice. Least corrupt nations have political will. Perhaps for South Africa to attain the necessary political will, pre-law education has to be explored in an attempt to construct this political will. So as I said, pre-law um, education is broad and also for the sake of time, I will focus on two elements or what I believe should be part of the education um, curriculum. So the first one is citizenship education. So citizenship education develops um, active um, citizens, including how to listen respectfully to the views of others and how to also effect change. It is therefore my belief that citizenship education um, can actually produce politically active um, citizens. So some scholars opine that social justice is not guaranteed by mere legal rights, but requires active and informed participation in decision-making. In other words, social justice must be asserted through a ballot box and an active civil society. So this means a strong participatory democracy grounded, grounded in equality and political engagement is therefore a prerequisite for a truly inclusive society. In such a democracy, individuals from all parts society vote and express their views within their communities in order to promote the kind of society they wish to see. Now, the inclusion of citizenship education does not automatically imply, um, you know, 
resulting in active citizenship. In the essence of this type of education, the method of teaching of a role. So it is my argument that in an open classroom where discussions and debates are held, students are likely to understand the importance of being active. In other words, for example, being active in a discussion means your opinions will be heard and you also have the obligation to hear other opinions. So the second element is um, uh, ethics or, or character education. So ethics also has an important role to play in education because education is a fundamental process of human life. In general, ethics is more of philosophy and it is related to our values and virtues. So generally in schools, students learn what is right and what is wrong and school fosters students to become truthful, respectful and just individuals. So this can be cemented with the introduction of ethical um, education. So no doubt corruption undermines morals and ethical principles, subsequently hindering the advancement of people's quality of life. So if one were to focus on ethical education, this would generally encompass inviting students to engage in societal matters with the aim of developing critical thinking, debates, and discussions. So why is ethical education important? It's important because what lies within society or within the center of society is actually ethics, morality, and um, values. So for the sake of time, I will not go through um, each time period, but this is a depiction of the development of the South African school um, curriculum. So the reason why this is important is because the current South African education um, curriculum attempts to address or aims to address the injustices of the past. It is equally important to acknowledge the history of the South African um, education curriculum. So this was just, um, if I had more time, I would have went through each um, time period. So I will just move on to the next um, presentation that deals with um, processes required for curriculum development. So there are three phases, information gathering, design and implementation. So what is common with all these phases is that they all require consultation and this is where active citizen participation can play a role. Now there are a number of ways in which the South African government can introduce anti-corruption education measures in, in, um, in schools. And as a point of reference, we can actually apply the OECD 2018 report on education for public integrity. And we can actually use it as a guideline. So in short, this report aims at educating children and youth in order to establish a culture of integrity. So the purpose of imparting such knowledge is to ensure that the skills and developed um, behavior is used to shape their country's future and help them uphold public integrity, which is an essential component in the fight against corruption. So as a frame of reference, the report provides approaches of public integrity that can actually be introduced in schools. So for example, one of the approaches is mainstream education. So this is where age appropriate courses are developed, um, revising existing teaching methods and also resources to achieve necessary outcomes. Then the second one would be having after school um, programs on ethics in order to enable students to engage with the content um, um, and not necessarily being confined to a classroom um, setting. So just to sum up and to wrap up my presentation, there are two points that I just want to highlight. The first one is that the existence of corruption weakens the essence of social justice, and therefore there is a need for a deliberate systematic plan to address the conundrum. Pre-law knowledge is significant in the legal education system because it creates a foundation for those who intend to study the law in the future. Another important factor is that pre-law education is important because it indoctrinates individuals with regard to how law can be applied and exposing them to governance, constitutional and democratic principles, all of this, which will play a role 
or has a role in the promotion or preservation of social justice. Dr. Munyai, um, uh, Dr. Munyai, yes, sorry to interrupt. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you please wind it up in two minutes? Yes, I'm actually done. That was actually my last um, slide. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munyai, for your presentation. Uh, just a reminder to those non-speaking to please mute your, your microphone so it doesn't disturb the, the presenters. We'll now move on to our third speaker, who is Prof Purvi, who will be speaking on Nurturing Champ, which is creative, holistic, altruistic, maverick, problem solvers, lawyers through adaptive clinical and Godridge. So over to you, Prof Purvi, for your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, respected uh, Professor Bakshi, uh, a dear friend, Professor Madhuri, Professor Varsha, Meghan, Sarsiv, Arpit, and all the dear students. Uh, well, uh, the title for my talk today is uh, Nurturing Champs, uh, Social Justice Lawyering Through Adaptive Clinical Andragogy. Now, in this context, uh, I would like to begin with the fact that law educators across the world have been contemplating, exploring, and experimenting in different ways for preparing holistic lawyers. We have a huge range of literature available in this regard. We have McRitter Report, we have Carnegie Foundation Report. If I talk about India, we have a 14th Law Commission of India report. We have first, second, third, and fourth generation of reforms in legal education. We have a very fantastic piece uh, uh, of research by Professor Baxi himself, the socially relevant legal education. So I would say that for several decades, legal educators have been debating about the appropriate mix of substance, skills, and ethics in the law school curriculum. And in this regard, we explore and design different and innovative curricula. We try and implement new pedagogy, andragogy. We deliberate on skill sets. We deliberate on assessment tools and techniques. We design different clinical exposes. We have been you know, organizing various faculty development program, faculty capacity building program. But at the end of the day, what we realize that as a law school, we cannot teach students every area of law or for that matter, every skills that they will use as lawyers. Uh, and that's the reason that priority is to be set on transfer the learning. I mean, I mean, and we have to set the priorities that how we can transfer the skills, uh, transfer the learning at law school to the novel situations that they will face in the legal profession. And so what I feel that building metacognitive strategies and building lifelong learning skills in the law school is extremely important. Uh, essentially, the metacognition is an ability to regulate and control one's learning. And metacognition, we can definitely understand by breaking down into the knowledge of cognition, the regulation of cognition, and how these two connect. And it is the process of thinking about thinking and ability to self-regulate one's learning with goal of transferring learning skills to new situation. Now, in this regard, if we talk about the, uh, you know, law educators, most of the law teachers, and specifically in the Indian context, I would like to say, most of the law teachers in the legal education institution, by and large, are yet to expose to the literature on learning theories. Generally, the way the law has been taught has tended to be based on how the instructor himself was taught or on how his or her colleague teach. And over the last couple of decades, however, the situation is changing. The law school educators have begun addressing this issue in an effort to improve students' outcome by integrating strategies into their teaching and they derive from these learning theories and research. However, we have miles to go, that's what I feel. Now, when we talk about social justice lawyering, in order to promote social justice lawyering, what I feel that we need to produce CHEMPS. Now, CHEMPS here uh, is the acronym that is being, you know, uh, being given by our, our dear friend, Shamnath Bashir. 
he used to say that how do we produce a creative, holistic, altruistic, maverick, and problem-solving lawyers? And in this context, law school required to recognize the importance of clinical teaching, integrating it with entire curriculum. Clinical teaching requires an adaptive approach. Clinical teacher design and redesign students' engagement based on trial, error, and reflection. Effective adaptive clinical andragogy consists of, of engagement, design credential, necessary protocols and procedure, supervision and assessment strategies. Now, this adaptive clinical andragogy is a structured method of guided analysis and reflection that applies to any clinical teaching situation. And in this regard, it's very important that we need to allow clinician to make a teaching choices based on as much as knowledge as much as is intentional possible. And that's the reason that adaptive clinical andragogy provides clinician with an approach for new issues that arise. And during that period of time, they need to build upon a base of knowledge so that each clinical choices is not experienced anew. And adaptive clinical andragogy with metacognitive strategies by a teacher that would lead to a transformative learning. That's what I believe. And transformative learning mean a creating opportunities for reflection and reorientation of learner's value. So in this talk, I intend to cover three aspects. The first being to explore different adaptive clinical andragogy models for various courses and how this model helped to promote the sense of social justice among budding lawyers. The second, uh, I really would like to identify key factors that boost the successful implementation of the uh, adaptive clinical andragogy model to produce gems. And uh, further, uh, elaborate how to build up the successive models of metacognition on the basis of the experiences and structured reflection. Now, if time permits, I, I intend to cover all these three points. Otherwise, I will briefly summarize this thing. Now, first, while we intend to produce CHEMP, one of the most important skills we need to nurture is promoting justice, fairness, and morality. Now, the question arises that, uh, can this be taught? Mm, I would like to say, yes, justice, fairness, and morality are teachable, provided we offer kind of experiences that makes compassionate insight possible. Now, we also need to discuss these values more fully throughout the curriculum. Ideally, you know, what we have seen in the, our law school curriculum, we have a courses like public interest lawyering, professional ethics, ethical understanding. However, these concepts are to be taught and oriented across all the courses in the entire curriculum that is very, very uh, vital. In this regard, discussion on justice is not sufficient but to create opportunities for students to exercise judgment. Through the examination of this judgment, we can increase our students' awareness and help them to develop a sense of justice. Now, we all know that though Emmanuel Kant said judgment is, is something that cannot be taught, it only can be practiced. However, I would like to uh, say that, how do we create a kind of an opportunities through clinical experiences, through clinical exposure, so that the students are being able to exercise their judgment and learn the science of justice and fairness. And in this context, uh, clinical adaptive andragogy play a very vital role. I'm reminded of Professor David, and he, uh, he said that we need to ask few questions while we are designing any kind of a clinical uh, exercises for our students in any of the courses. And, uh, and these questions could be, the first being, what do we consider to be a just society? What are the terms of just society? What kind of a behavior that tend towards facilitating creating of such kind of a society? What behavior undermines a society we consider just? How do we ought to organize ourselves and our political institutions so that they behave in a manner we consider just. 
how do we or ought we under we ensure that our political institutions are generative adaptive self evaluative and regenerative and finally what ideals are integral to workable vision of individual and social human committed to living a just life so through reflection of the seven questions in our clinical uh, adaptive and pedagogical experiences that we are designing for our students in different courses probably we are helping them to become a reflective professionals uh, because it is said that one way to approach learning about justice fairness and morality is to teach our students to deconstruct power to identify privileges and take responsibility for the ways in which law confers dominance clinical intervention at relevant point is very crucial in this regard and at this juncture i am reminded of the old chinese proverb you know uh, it says that we see what is behind our eyes and that's the reason in order to learn about how to promote justice the learner must understand how power affect vision and value you know my uh, as earlier speaker also had had some kind of an insight into this legal educators role is to help students see how their experiences affect their value and how this value affect their assessment of the law that will help the students to learn about the compassion now compassion here is sympathetic consciousness about others distress with a desire to act to alleviate it compassion requires action it's not merely an empathy it requires more than knowing not and sympathetic gesture compassionate lawyering that is desire to alleviate another's distress or to act affirmatively is the essence of our clinical andragogy in the social justice context the skill of compassion is the ability to appreciate that we operate with only partial perspective and to recognize that many of us have privileges and most of them are not earned through any of our personal effort on our part but they color our perception of the claim and they color our perception of many of the aspects that we observe we can better promote justice if we can understand how injustice depend on people's inability to examine how their own values may reinforces this dominance and how to build this consciousness through clinical legal uh, clinical legal andragogy is the very vital questions now uh, this for for uh, for adopting this clinical uh, engagement clinical uh, legal andragogy engagement we have to undergo a six steps that is being uh, mentioned in number of literature the st six steps maybe uh, the acronym we can give as an adopt the first being an articulate we need to articulate the situation second we need to define the expectation third uh, we need to analyze the contributing factors uh, fourth we have to ponder the potential strategies then take action and then shape future choices through reflection now this framework allows our students for structured reflection in which the dynamics of clinical teachings are observed analyzed and revised and this is a continuous process and this is the reason that this model provides a structure that allows the clinical teacher to examine many contexts in which the teaching of skill development happens a personal evolution takes place and thus i would say that this clinical uh, this adaptive clinical andragogy can serve as a model for new clinicians and also the experienced clinicians to develop the teaching skills and also to help them to uh, you know provide a framework for experiential uh, uh, experiential uh, you know uh, experiential exposure to the students i would say that this adaptive clinical andragogy is not only the structured approach to teaching and supervising students but it also provides the method for the reflection and also Uh, provides an opportunity to influence the scholars in psychology sociology uh, learning adult learning and the clinical pedagogy uh, there are uh, four core principles uh, when well, any teacher who is trying to adopt 
this uh, this clinical uh, adaptive clinical andragogy uh, uh, for any of the courses there are four core principles that we have to observe uh, first being that uh, everything the clinical teacher does is a choice amongst the wide range of options that he or she may have and these choices are very conscious these choices are ideally intentional choices to further students uh, education second being the success of any model of this teaching or individual clinic is necessarily tied to some kind of a goals that is being set by the clinical teacher the, the structure of these uh, adaptive clinical teaching is more useful to a clinical to teacher who has thoughtfully considered a uh, different kind of a goals that uh, that he intend to achieve at the end of the experiences at the end of the exposure through a uh, different kind of a reflective practices model the third being a clinical teacher uh, should meet the student where she is and this is this is very very vital because uh, you know you know at, at at many occasions that we have observed that the student's failure is generally being uh, linked with his or her inability to grasp uh, or experience certain things however this principle says that any lack of progress in student learning is the clinical teacher's responsibility and not the fault of the student and the uh, I, i mean this is the principle that maximize students learning is uh, which is which is based on the individual learning style inventory and uh, it, it is based on the individual needs strength and capability of the students and that makes the uh, this principle uh, is very vital and you know it is grounded in the theories of the adult learning i would say the fourth principle is that adaptive uh, clinical uh, teaching you know uh, that always challenges the clinical teacher to practice what they preach now we cannot have a two different uh, two uh, different uh, uh, notion because a core element of clinical teaching is asking students to be reflective thoughtful and strategic in their learning and in their learning skills now that's the reason that i would say that this adaptive clinical teaching is a structured intellectual framework for teaching that enables and challenges the clinical teacher to do the exact same thing that we ask our students to do and observe and that's the reason it's 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 extremely uh, challenging for a teachers to put forth and design a different kind of an exposure and the reflect uh, Uh, upon their learning and linking that reflection with the goals that they have set for uh, while designing this uh, clinical exposure uh, so uh, at the end you know probably uh, what i what my humble submission is that if you want to create chance you know uh, the the creative holistic maverick uh, uh, problem solving lawyers uh, who are adequately trained in promoting social justice what we need is a fundamental restructuring and rethinking uh, of the of our approach the way in which we look at legal education uh, and we may need to change uh, and we need to reorient reorient ourselves with an approach be from the base focusing more on individual learners reflecting uh, reflecting upon their behavioral change that we are inducing through the adaptive clinical andragogy and uh, while we are induced while we are we are trying to induce this change in this uh, uh, in the behavioral pattern probably we need to also imbibe a lot of uh, different kind of a metacognition strategies making them responsible making them aware about their own learning so uh, this is uh, a very complex at times you know uh, this is what i feel that is very complex process because uh, we need to have a mind mapping we need to have a characteristics we need to have a very mi- micro uh, design of uh, our clinical uh, experiences that we are designing for the students and then once the students undergo these experiences you know linking their reflection with the goal that we have set and linking and then from that goal uh, linking and delinking of their learning is uh, very vital and this is how probably Uh, we make them realize about uh, 
uh, where they stand and you know what do they learn and you know and what are the things that uh, they they need to correct when it, they need to adapt in order to uh, in order to understand uh, their learning pattern and this is how probably uh, we are exposing them to the societal realities uh, and then we are exposing them to the kind of privileges probably they are into and you know how the injustice is being uh, is being carried out through the power dynamic structures that that exist in the society so uh, the, the, the final thing which i would like to share that is all about the kind of uh, continuous uh, adaptation of our andragogy of the experiences designing uh, of the different uh, experience that we design for our students is extremely vital i would be happy to take any questions that ca that comes at the end of the session thank you thank you so much prof for that uh, lovely presentation i'm sure there will be a lot of questions that we have a reminder that we are taking questions at the in the chat box so please type in your questions um, and and uh, Alfred and myself will ask those questions at the end. Our final speaker for today is Dr. Michelle van Eck. She will be presenting on legal education and ethics, a road towards social justice. So Dr. van Eck, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Reddy. Uh, if you can perhaps just confirm that you can see the slides, I'd appreciate that. Yes, I can see them clearly. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for all the speakers today. Uh, I must say a lot of what has been uh, said has really resonated with me. And, and I hope that this last presentation can, can fill um, and add to, to what has already been said. Now, um, what I would like to talk about today is this connection between legal education, legal practice, and the normative duties of lawyers in achieving social justice. Now, perhaps to start, and let's just see if I can get this to move. There we go. Um, so, Justice Longer, who was the chief justice at the time, said that the way we teach law students and the values and philosophies we install in them will define the legal landscape of the future. And this statement serves as the premise to this paper as there's certainly a interconnectedness or interconnectedness between legal practice and legal education. As we know, social justice issues are complex and they contain a chain of influences that eventually manifest themselves either directly or indirectly in legal practice. And to illustrate this, uh, and specifically those chains of influences, I, I propose to start with the end goal in mind. And that is with social justice itself, and then work backwards from there. And social justice, according to some of the most common definitions, describes this fair access and equitable distribution to opportunities, resources, and privileges, burdens, and so on. The second part to this chain of influences and the legal sector is the role of lawyers. And this role, uh, one could say, is there to achieve the social, social justice ideals within society. And this can certainly occur directly where a lawyer is a human rights or social justice lawyer, or indirectly, where there's the day-to-day -day conduct of the lawyer, where they fulfill their, their functional role within society. And this could have a positive or a negative impact in the achievement of social justice. The third and final part to this chain is legal education, which feeds into legal practice and, and really does, like Justice Longer said, shape the legal landscape of the future. Legal education can then be said to be this epicenter to social justice issues that manifest within the legal sector. And in this, we see that one of the purposes of legal education is to equip our graduates to effectively function as a lawyer. And this includes the skills and competencies where we are dealing with the functional role of the lawyer, but also the normative considerations. Now, lawyers are intimately involved in the system of justice. 
and they are certainly part of the solution. But lawyers can also, in some instances, be part of the problem. And this can occur indirectly when opportunism in service delivery, and this is really the making of money at the expense of justice, is in a direct opposition to social justice frameworks. This talks to our substantive equality, which is part of Justice Longer's conceptual framework of constitutional transformatism. And this can be illustrated uh, in four major categories, uh, where we can see how the conduct of lawyers may influence social justice within the country. And I've just put up some examples. The first category is the misleading of co the court or hampering of justice. And here we find the source of this issue in the dishonest conduct of lawyers in fulfilling their functional role. The second is the abuse of positional power of the lawyer. And here we can see an example of this in our pre-constitutional regime, where a lawyer in the Gamit case uh, was found to have abused their position and thereby ex you know, they extorted certain monies. Our third category, which I find quite interesting, is how there is an abuse of process, either by the lawyer or by their clients. And that is the abuse of court processes, uh, which has a direct impact on social justice, being the ability to adjudicate disputes in our court system, which ultimately leads to the issue of justice and equality. To illustrate this, we can look at, our, again, at a pre-constitutional case of Kano, where the court said that the, these rules of court, which are really a subset of, of civil procedure, is intended to dispense justice uniformly and fairly. The court also then cautioned against the so-called unscrupulous litigant and those that would delay or deny justice to manipulate court processes in order to frustrate its purpose. Now, what I find very interesting in this is this comparison that the court drew, drew between opportunism to make profit and the abuse of court process. And here we can see this drive for individual pro profit has a potential of impacting access to justice. Now, one would think that after the promulgation of the Constitution, this type of profit-driven conduct at the expense of ju the justice system would have been eradicated. But this is seemingly not the case, because in 2013, in the case of Motswai, we see an example of the road accident compensation system being what the court describes systematically exploited by various stakeholders, including lawyers. In fact, the court went and described this conduct as being predatory cable, conspiring, if you will, of administrators, attorneys, advocates, professional experts, that has abused the system to the detriment of accident victims and the taxpayer. Again, here we see that this has been done for individual profit at the expense of the public. Now, if it's not already been an indication that there's a problem within the legal sector, we only have to talk, turn to our fourth category, which is the uh, charging of exorbitant fees. Now, high fees are intended to make profit for lawyers, but it also impacts the, and denies individuals access to justice, making it unaffordable for the average person to have access to legal services, which is certainly a social justice issue. And there are some examples to this. The Sele and Sabia matters, where there were the use of standard form documents to create these production lines in court to obtain cost orders against a public body, which impacted the public purse. The most striking, however, is the comments of the court in Mafanguana, where a lawyer overreached in their fees. And the court said here that this type of conduct is one of grave concern and is a manifestation of a possible endemic corruption embedded in the attorney's profession. The court went as far as to send a copy of this judgment to the Law Society 
to consider ways and means of stopping the rot. For me, these cases are, uh, indicate a serious problem, not only in the legal profession, but also the indirect consequences that a lawyer's conduct has on social justice issues, particularly that of access to justice. And if we accept this principle that the core role of legal education is to prepare le uh, future graduates for industry and for commerce, then the question is what role does legal education play in fostering the right conduct and culture to avoid these types of social justice issues in the future? And to answer this, we need to appreciate that lawyers have dual roles. They are both a service provider, but also a custodian of the law. In other words, they are ambassadors of justice. And the service provider must then be able to fulfill their functional duties as a lawyer. So they must have the typical skills, knowledge, and competencies that um, the lawyer in society is required to have. But when we are talking about the custodians of the law and the social responsibilities of a lawyer, we move into the realm of what we call normative duties of the lawyer. And this includes values, norms, standards, and dare I say, ethics. These normative duties are expected conducts in order to complete the functional role and goes hand in glove to this concept of substantive equality in society. Now in South Africa, we have some um, areas where these legal ethical standards are found. The Legal Practice Act, our Code of Conduct, which was promulgated in terms of Section 36.1 of the Legal Practice Act, which really is described as the prevailing standard of conduct for lawyers, our regulations and rules of the Legal Practice uh, Council, and our common law, which is case law determinations. So if legal ethics is essentially then the professional conduct required of a lawyer, um, then we need to look at also the normative responsibilities or the so-called uh, professional norms, which goes further than just legal ethics. And the reason why it goes further can be summarized in the words of Henderson, which notes that uh, one of the aspects of the normative component is recognizing the unique social responsibility that a lawyer has. And this is the crux of the issue. The role of the lawyer, although a service provider, contains certain social responsibilities embedded in the normative duties of the lawyer. Now, one may think that the social responsibilities of the lawyer is limited to pro bono work. But we've seen that cases, the cases we've, we've briefly looked at, that it goes further than that. It goes to the services that are provided and the way uh, fees are charged. Now, if we then accept that the position of legal education is then there to equip our future graduates to have the necessary skills to navigate the legal profession, and we accept that legal practitioners have certain social responsibilities, how does this relate to legal education? Well, I've adapted a presentation of the 2020 BRICS Law Forum that, that was presented last year. Um, and we can, can consider legal education in four layers. And I've adapted this to deal with social justice. And our first layer is our academic layer. And this is typically related to higher education. And our normative elements that can be found in this is, for example, specific uh, social justice subjects like uh, within our curriculum, teaching of legal ethics, clinical legal education, and so on. The second layer is our vocational or apprenticeship layer. And this layer typically relates to the legal education or education received in the apprenticeship or articles when studying to become a lawyer or an advocate. In other words, it relates to that training that happens after you've received a law degree, but before you've been admitted into the profession. And here we see law graduates being taught legal ethics and may also be exposed to pro bono work. 
And obviously, if the law graduate is placed in a law firm that deals with social justice issues, then they may have greater exposure to those elements of the law. The third layer is the layer that uh, deals with the admission of a lawyer into the, or a, a law graduate into the profession. And this is where there is the passing of the bar or sidebar exams. And the focus here is really on functional elements of, of the law. Uh, there may be sometimes certain inclusions on legal ethics, but certainly not the uh, focus area. The final layer is the layer of con continuing education or the professional layer of education. And here a lawyer is educated by means of postgraduate studies on the job training and the experience. Now, unless there is a focus on the normative element on postgraduate studies, there's very little focus on, um, focus on that. And other than, for example, pro bono work. So as legal educators, we are then interested in teaching the minds of our graduates. In other words, ensuring that law graduates acquire those skills, knowledge, and competencies to successfully navigate these fu functional, um, functional areas. But in some instances, we see that in this pursuit of acquiring those skills and knowledge, there are barriers to the normative element of education. And there are certain types. The first is the overemphasis on the functional area of the lawyer. And this means that our curriculum focuses purely on the acquiring of skills and knowledge and competencies, um, which, is, uh, uh, which is to the exclusion of our normative value-based system. There's also a focus on this inherited, uh, inherited approach of legal positivism, where the law itself is considered as having an internal morality, and we teach the law as it is, devoid of other morals, values, and ethics, and considerations in relation to that. However, there is an interconnectedness between law and social sciences, which we must take note of. This goes hand in glove with this third uh, barrier, which is uh, that of a strong doctrinal education in our focus of legal education. And this naturally originates from our legal heritage, but it may not always be relevant as an exclusive consideration in this contemporary legal environment, uh, where the law has really become an interdisciplinary type of uh, function. The final issue is that of legalism. And in fact, one can say that legalism is one of the inhibitors to social justice. And what I find interesting is words of Alkins, who said, when legal discourse is viewed as autonomous and independent of other social institutions, divorced from economics, politics, sociology, psychology, and even separated from morality, then legal thinking has transformed into legalism. The law cannot be divorced from its social constructs, um, and, and there has to be a wider consideration. The issue of normative duties impacting the conduct of lawyer, a lawyers can be borrowed from the words of Alkins, which says that the dilemma is a real one, and it is fundamental to the idea of ethical analysis and choice. There then seems to be this need to help law graduates and our future lawyers to make the right choices. In other words, the correct ethical choice. And to do this, legal education must consider both the functional and normative duties that is provided in all four layers of education. As legal educators, we must be careful that we don't train our future lawyers solely to fulfill a functional role without also highlighting the importance of the role of lawyers in society. Perhaps I can borrow from the lyrics of Green Day in their song of 21 Guns, and I've adapted it to say that we should, in our pursuit of education and knowledge, 
guard against our minds killing the spirit of our soul. In other words, we must not allow our pursuit of functional knowledge, skills, and competencies of the law permit us to lose our humanity. If there's any hope of addressing social justice in, in uh, social injustices, we cannot look at it through the lens of the law alone, which is an intellectual solution. As we've seen, social justice issues cannot be solved by clever thinking alone. Rather, we should look through the lens of normative consideration and ethics being our hearts and address our lawyers and future graduates' responsibility to society. It is, I think, really the teaching of the hearts and the minds of our future graduates that will turn the tide in developing a robust legal culture that fights for social justice in all areas of legal practice. And by doing this, we may very well cultivate the humanity of our graduates and future lawyers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Van Eck, for your presentation. And thank you once again to all the speakers. Um, I'll hand over to Alfred uh, quickly to uh, provide some comments, and then we'll go through the questions that we received in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, uh, session. Uh, and uh, means we have so much different perspective. We and Sharshav is like uh, we were discussing in the means uh, in the chat before this particular event that this is going to be a very means helpful and a holistic vision. And somehow, uh, Sharshav, now we can uh, see that uh, from the very foundational part to the new liberalism era to the part with respect to ethics that keeps us to, to the rise of andragogy. So that's like uh, a means uh, a holistic vision with respect to this particular topic is concerned. And we have so much different uh, means viewpoints uh, with respect to legal education and how we can integrate legal education. And if I summarize, if I need few points, uh, uh, which is like uh, uh, means give uh, insight to think after this webinar, because I know that uh, after completion of this webinar, I am going to spend lot many lot much time in order to understand, in order to integrate into my teachings. So uh, let me just take a few of uh, the points which we basically discussed during this particular webinar. Uh, first of all, uh, the concept of D in new liberalism, uh, which Professor Bakshi told us, uh, is like very new to me. When I get that particular synopsis, I start searching on it, and. Uh, Somehow I find it that uh, when we talk about new liberalism and uh, the technological innovation society, we have to think critical and at the same point of time, we have to follow these basic four folds that is learning, thinking, training, and uh, writing. And uh, this is something which basically bring uh, a lot much responsibilities to the teacher in order to get a clear path how we can achieve these targets. Moving on to that, uh, uh, after that, the Dr. Mirani basically talks about uh, the part of uh, legal ethics, legal education, a foundational education, where we can integrate uh, these sort of um, uh, means we can remove all sort of corruption while providing, uh, by providing learning to them that uh, from the very beginning, that uh, they should uh, be like uh, uh, a person who is ready for social justice and they are able to understand before they are going into the taking up the course. So pre-law sort of thing and whatever is like society is facing, if they are like very well prepared, well in advance, that will be like very helpful uh, in order to basically go for that particular course. Moving further, uh, Dr. Biani also mentioned that uh, pre-law is important for analytical view. And that is something uh, because if uh, I remember myself that during the preparation, I find that uh, uh, when I entered in my law school times, analytical thinking is important and that required a pre-knowledge as well. Moving on to that, uh, uh, 
Professor Pokhriyal mentioned uh, about andragogy means that is something which is adult learning andragogy. That's something which is like uh, very fascinating to me that uh, if we talk about uh, social relevant uh, social justice and a relevant uh, relevant for the law students, first thing which is like very important that we need to connect ourselves being a instructor, being a teacher, being a mentor, that what feels, what emotion is there with the subject. And that is some something which basically brings and that is something which inculcate and that is something which uh, basically excite to do the things in a very positive manner and uh, the champ concept is like uh, a very uh, new to me and uh, social justice lawyering undoubtedly means we know pro bono every means we know and we heard about this pro bono sort of thing but at the same point of time if all these points being inculcated and if being uh, during this journey of three years or five years if they incorporate it, then that is something which is like a prof professional ready uh, sort of students. Moving on to that, uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Mikhail mentioned about uh, uh, the legal education and practicing lawyers. And uh, that particular perspective uh, talks about legal ethics, social responsibility for lawyers and pro bono functions of lawyer, what is like a value addition to the system. And that's something which brings responsibility not only to us, but also those who are in means those who are like uh, doing law uh, as a uh, law study as a part of their curriculum. So a holistic vision basically gives lot much thing, lot much insight. And we have lot many questions uh, because uh, uh, some of the students posted in personal that uh, they wanted to ask this particular question to these speakers. So before uh, we can move on to the Questions, uh, if uh, I think my connection was a little unstable. Uh, so my last submission is like uh, uh, means uh, I have received a lot many questions from my students, and uh, they wanted means they have mentioned that please ask this particular to these speakers, and they have uh, means identify all these. Uh, things to ask. And before we can move on to the question answer, uh, I request that if you have anything to uh, add on to it, or if I miss something, please uh, just add that particular part to it. Over to you, Sharshiv. Thank you so much, Arpit. I, I agree with your sentiments in that we have a holistic approach. Um, Prof. Bakshi, you, you importantly talked about how um, the market and technological innovation is a good thing, but how it can also be barriers and prevent education and writing and legal thinking. Um, it was a very, very interesting uh, topic. Um, I, I read in your, in your paper as well, you talked about the post-millennial learner and how um, you know, they, they only want to learn digitally, not paper-based. And, and we are so used to, we came through the paper-based uh, learning and thinking and writing. And now the students refuse to learn that way. They want a computer or they want social media to learn. So uh, I felt it, you know, it is very, very interesting also to look at the discrimination based on gender or sex um, and the different ways in which neoliberalism can benefit, but also be a disadvantage to, to our students. Uh, moving on to Dr. Munyai, I think your foundational uh, learning and ethics was also very important. Um, we look at wasted state expenditure and how that expenditure could possibly be used towards creating a new curriculum and um, teaching our young learners about ethics, because I think ethics, we only learn later on. And it's something that can actually start at home from your own parents and learning, um, you know, what is the right, what is the difference between right and wrong? And, you know, why is corrupt? Because as you said correctly, corruption, some people view as, no, it's fine. I can, if this person can steal money, why can I not steal money? So I think ethics uh, is a very important uh, concept in terms of social justice. And I'm sure there, are, there will be some questions on that. Uh, Dr. Professor Pukriyal, I, I really enjoyed your, your presentation. And something that resonated in me was when you said, we teach the way we were taught. And that is so true. It's very subjective. I think, um, you know, we only can teach what we have learned. And especially nowadays, tying into what Professor Baxi has said with, with innovation, 
we now have to have a holistic teacher. You have to have someone who is more practical. You can't only teach the theoretical. So having these clinical teachings and becoming more practical in your teaching, uh, I think is very, very important, especially now with the new fourth industrial revolution and the new ways and methods of teaching and to give students a holistic approach. As we said, uh, if I teach criminal law, it will be different to where you have taught criminal law because you have learned criminal law differently to me. So I think it's very, very important. As Alfred said, we now have to reflect after this session and, and you know, become better academics and, and teach in a different way and become more practical. And then finally, Dr. Van Eck, you talked about the professionals, which I really enjoyed. Um, and you talked also about ethics and corruption. And I think one of the things that, that also uh, I felt was really important is that it seems that only the, those who are rich and powerful are able to access justice. So the point about pro bono, I think, needs to be um, talked about more as to how we can access justice to our lower income or our disadvantaged uh, communities. And, um, you know, tying into Dr. Munyai's about corruption and, you know, wasting state expenditure, I think that also ties in with professionals because you can't have a situation where only the higher income people have access to justice and um, can only now bring their matters to court. So you need to have uh, social justice where there's fairness across the board for all um, citizens, whether you are getting paid or you're not getting paid. So as Alfred said, you know, a holistic approach, we started off from the foundational phase and we went all the way up to the professionals. And there are some questions in the chat. Alfred, I don't know if you want to start because I have a direct message from, from Megan or do you want me to start? Okay, uh, I'll start first uh, and then we will move ahead. Uh, so first question, uh, which I receive is like quite big, but I am just uh, make a summary note to it. Uh, so this particular question is uh, uh, to Professor Bakshi that uh, uh, when we talk about uh, LTTW, uh, learning, teaching, training, uh, and writing. So all the four folds are equally important. First question is related to that, or it's like uh, uh, we have to give importance while we are into the teaching to any one of it. Secondly, the subsequent question is, uh, whether all the four folds uh, which can be used for social formation can be used for social transformation because in india uh, the example quoted is like in some of the university we have social transformation when we talk about uh, means reflections so past uh, incident is uh, basically mentioned that particular statement so that's like a summary question so there are two questions into it you want, to, <clears throat> you want me to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, take them now? Yes, yeah. please, sir. Oh, very, very briefly. Uh, thank you very much for your concern. Uh, I like this play on second uh, aspect, namely social formation versus social transformation. You can also speak of social reformation and social stagnation and so on and so forth. Um, but I was using social formation in the sense that uh, Uncle Marx, Karl Marx loses, a scientist, Karl Marx scientist, not the polemicist. Uh, the scientific work I him in five volumes of Capital, he in fact was describing a mode of production, production of what? Of knowledges, of goods and services, of styles and fashion, uh, production of politics, and production of religion. Everything, mode of production, is a mode that is not only economic, but also cultural and civilization. I add to it. So I was thinking in that sense, but you're quite right to suggest um, that transformation can be opposed to formations. And Uncle Marx used to say, the scientific Marx used to say, that no doubt human beings may make history, but not, and he said that at liberty, not just as they please. So formation, transformation, transformation is a more difficult task for social formation, as Professor Maker said, is the established order. And it's very difficult to change the established order as such. You can 
like a jigsaw puzzle, saying a few things. So essentially, these two are very important concerns. I would simply say to my friend, it's very important for law teachers and students and what everybody said here today, it's very important to ask a simple question. Who sits inside my head when I say that I think? Who is doing the thinking on your behalf when you say you think? This is the fundamental question of all education, precisely for legal education. And in neoliberal times, that was my thesis, when we say we think, it is the market which does the thinking on our behalf. And then it is the state which does the thinking on our behalf. And what we adopt from what is our political unconscious is the state and the market. It could be religion also, it could be something else. So it's important to identify who is that I who is doing this thinking. And then order your priorities between thinking, reading, writing. I say teaching is there's no such thing as teaching. It is always called learning. So a teacher is a co-learner and a learner is a, is a potential teacher in a dialogue. Everything I have known in law and every question, important question I learned about was through a dialogue with my class. And that was your experience too. It's a dialogical process. Uh, so I think one can set up such a part with thinking, reading, writing, talking. You can change the t, 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 two T's in different directions. But I think essentially one is talking about process, not structures. Formation brings the structure, mode of production. When talking, teaching, these are activities, as Paul we said earlier. Teaching, thinking, learning, teaching, if there is a difference. Thinking, and when does thinking begin? It's a main question. But maybe you can prioritize thinking. It depends entirely on you. How you want to receive this, whether it want to receive it linear or multilinear for more formulation. Sorry, I also take time. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for such an insight uh, answer because uh, again, means through the question and through answer, I also get some more points to add on to it. And I am writing down so that after the webinar, I'll search on it. So I'm just uh, moving ahead with the uh, next question. Uh, that question is to uh, Dr. Miani, and that is uh, related to uh, the part uh, when we talk about uh, ethics in education, means pre-education, uh, pre-law education, and the duty towards society. Which is like more student for uh, which is like more important for our law students means one side we have uh, uh, pre uh, means ethics with respect to uh, the pre uh, law school and uh, second one is like duty towards society that is from the student side. Okay, can you just repeat um, the question? I didn't get the last part of it. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Uh, uh, the Point, uh, the point over here is like um, ethics uh, uh, with respect to pre-law schools, means which we learn uh, during uh, pre-law schools. And second is like uh, duty towards uh, the society, which is like more important as a law students, which think which we need to basically <laughs> give more importance. That's from the student okay. side. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I honestly don't think there is one that weighs more than the other or one that is important, um, more, like more important than the other. However, I do believe that the pre-law school um, uh, um, ethics um, does actually play a role or contributes to the ethics when you are now advanced or in, in law school. So I actually would 
don't approach them in isolation, but there is a relationship and one tends to, one is a foundational basis of the other. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And uh, uh, next question is uh, to uh, put, uh, uh, Professor Pokhriyal, ma'am. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, means uh, from the side of the student, and they wanted to know that uh, when we talk about uh, adoptive clinical andragogy, and we have diff diversified students in the, in, the, in the institute, how we can make uh, unified methodology related to same? Well, I, uh, I mean, homo, I am not uh, of the opinion that there should be a uniform method to be adopted because we need to customize our uh, teaching pedagogy or andragogy uh, uh, which matches with the student's aspirations, student's learning style inventory, st student uh, you know, skill set. So that is what is the real struggle that will drive with the teachers. That's what I believe. So it's not necessary that we cater to the uniform approach or we, we follow the uniform approach and uniform method uh, for all these students you know we may go to a very uh, you know uh, individualistic uh, uh, we may adopt the inter individualistic uh, method uh, so that uh, you know it really fulfills the individual students aspirations and it matches with the uh, students uh, learning style that's what I always believe and it's a real challenge. Thank you, ma'am. And that's true. It's like a real challenge to unify the things and make it uh, in a means individualistic, individualistic way. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I have one more question to uh, Dr. Mikhail. Uh, that is a little, uh, means it is specifically mentioned that we, if we think through a practical lens, then the legal duty to represent the client, that is something which is like uh, uh, professional ethics. And at the same point of time, uh, duty towards society, because sometimes we need to represent uh, those who are like uh, wrong to it. So how we can make a balance out of uh, these, these two opposite corners? Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's a very important question. And, and I think that we need to differentiate between the issue of legal ethics and, and general ethics. Uh, legal ethics is a subset of what we call general ethics. And um, within that framework of legal ethics, there are certain rules and, and processes. Within those rules and processes are, for example, this whole concept of um, uh, our duties towards clients, our duties towards the courts, our duties towards third parties, for example. And there's a whole set of rules for that. And you'll see that across many countries, these rules do, do um um, harmonize in a, in a way. So there, there is that aspect. But in the other, the other point of that is how do we go about fulfilling those rules? Um, so although we have to uh, uh, protect the interest of uh, clients which may be criminally liable or, or criminal, for example, um, there are ways of going about that. Um, and that is... is the balance that needs to be struck. And I don't think there's e easy answers for that. Um, so there is this balancing act, not only as a service provider, but within your general structure of your law society with legal ethics, but also your general ethical approach to that. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yes, Dr. Mikkel, thank you for uh, the answer, because uh, this is something which is like uh, uh, a very means uh, a debatable sort of thing that how we can manage these two opposite corners. Uh, so uh, if, because we have paucity of time and there are a lot many questions. So I request uh, uh, Sirship, if you have uh, the questions, you can just post it to the panel. So that is very helpful. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Arpit. Um, Prof Bakshi, there is a question for you that was uh, posted in the chat. It says, given the increasing privatization of public amenities, what prospects do you think Article 15, subsection 2 of the Indian Constitution has, even in the more narrow realm of anti-discrimination law, 
as one potential litigation based tool for expanding access. That's for me. That's for you, Prof. Well, I, I, the way I pronounce the word access, very many people think I'm talking about access. Oh, <laughs> the link between access, who has access to justice or justice according to law. Uh, ideally, everyone should have. But, and that ties in with the question of responsibility and so on. Uh, but in reality, it is the lack of access or inequality of access that matters. Some discussion was made about the lawyers' obligations to society and lawyers' morality. I think that's a very important area. Um, does litigation reflect wider access or constricted access to courts? I'm talking about strict justice, assuming courts deliver justice. I taught for a number of years in Warwick, and I heard from a, a story from a cab driver from Heathrow to Leamington, he was taking me with plenty of time. And he said, sir, sir, I tell you some jokes. And one of the jokes, he told me stories. And one of the stories he told me, he said, a person like you came to his airport and said you to go, he has to go after a few hours, a couple of hours. So please take me down London and show me the courts of justice. So he went round and round the city of London, it's a very nice tour, and brought the gentleman back to his airport to catch the next flight and asked for 200 pounds. And he said, I'm willing to pay your prayer, but you tell me why did you not show me a court of justice? And like a good English person, he stood up, step up or left, and he said, sir, in England, there are only courts of law. There are no courts of justice. There's sometimes we hear stories of access from the constitutional underclasses. You know, the going rate in um, England to a higher resort. In my time when I was there, was nothing less than 50,000 pounds. Not many people can't afford it. Your mention was made of litigation fees and so on. But apart from the education with the lawyer's fees. Uh, so there is a problem of access. The attempts to broaden access by some certain courts and judges, like social action or public interest litigation or consumer litigation. The appearance of a wider access to law is a socially necessary illusion. What we have to consider is let the illusion remain in place because we need certain illusions. That's why they are necessary. They are actually the case or not is a different matter. But we must have certain good illusions in place. Like what we remember religion, theodicy, certain faith, if possible because you believe in some kind of transhuman God person or being. So certainly, but let the illusion stay there. Without this, this lodging the illusion, we must find out what percentage of people we have in mind when we talk of access to justice. And within that two or some, if you're 50%, what is your ideal access to justice addressed by court, or ideal quotient? You are free to fix it. You tell me about that and then to talk about access to justice begins. There are two kinds of people in the world. One, who go to courts. Other, who are taken to courts. How many people do you want to be in the first category? Is that 20%? That is, then talk about access. 40%, 100%? Well, you can then talk about access. How many in the second category? They were taken to courts. Somebody said, uh, you, 
I think the copiers said that he was interested in Arpit said they were interested in criminal law, teaching criminal law. They would know the answer. What is the proportion of people who are taken to court versus those who go to court in any, any society? Access is a very concrete matter in one sense and very illusory matter in another sense. Illusion we must preserve like a rule of law. We know in our society has a hundred percent rule of law, separation of power. So if a court called quantify what satisfies you, minimum threshold. And then we can talk about access. How many people would have access? What 20%, 15%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 100%? There's no society which gives 100% of access. So below that, what is your threshold? And then you can divide them, people into access to consumer cases, access to matrimonial remedies, access to constitutional remedies, access to statutory remedies, a number of other things. You can divide, subdivide. But you must have some threshold before we talk about access. I'm, I spent my whole life normatively and empirically in finding an answer to a question, and I plead for your help. I have not found an answer. What is a satisfactory threshold for access? Thank, Thank you. you. I agree with you 100%. It's, it is an illusion concept. Uh, it depends on um, you know, your, your state of circumstances. It depends what remedy you are trying to achieve. Uh, in theory, everybody should have access to court, but does it mean that everybody can actually now fulfill themselves by getting into court and going through the proceedings? And as you said, it's very complex. It depends on what your matter is about, your monetary value, or what it is that you are trying to claim. So I agree with you that the concept is very complex and it's not a, a straightforward answer. Um, Dr. Munyai, there's a question for you. It says, I'd love to know your thoughts on South Africa's Foundation for Human Rights Attitudinal Survey on Constitutional Literacy, which showed that awareness of the constitution in South Africa is still very low. In addition to school level foundational education, do you think there is a role for adult learning programs? Okay. Uh, thank you so much um, for the question. Um, so the survey for me, when I looked at it, two things um, resonated with me. So the first portion um, related to um, participants not being aware, um, which then links to um, the education part of my presentation, and also the fact that poverty increase decreases um, awareness somehow. So that for me speaks to the element of corruption. So. On the part of um, uh, um, people not being aware, like I said, this is um, the core of my presentation and it actually highlights that there is a need to expose our people to basic constitutional principles for, 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 for example. So to me, it is really unfortunate that from 1994 until now, there are individuals who are still not aware of the Bill of Rights. So. It is therefore my argument that the education curriculum has to be revised in an attempt to expose our people to such, um, uh, to the constitution, to democratic principles, um, for example. And this can actually be maximized or this can be tied to um, compulsory um, 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 education. So if we link the two, then we will at least um, attempt to ensure that the greater people of South Africa are actually aware of the constitutional principles. So on the side of poverty, again, it links to corruption in my opinion. Again, it is unfortunate, but the reality is that um, poverty, um, particularly amongst Black South Africans, it's due to the injustices of the past. And it's also um, unfortunate that the existence of corruption, the more it thrives, the more it increases the poverty scale. So from a pan-African point of, of, of view, the injustice of Black people is often related to, and this is, again, based on the corruption scale in Africa, 
as a result of African leaders engaging in corrupt acts with the intention of, for instance, accumulating state resources. So when they do this, they are deliberately choosing to deprive individuals entitled to state resources aimed at correcting those past injustices. So for me, the circle will not stop. It will continue until we get to a point where political will or rather active political will is evident. And for us to get to that point, we need to allow education to play its role. We need to allow education to ensure that principles are certain democratic constitutional principles are engraved within society. So overall, if there is equal distribution of wealth, meaning um, corruption is eradicated or at least eradicated to some extent, poverty will decrease and based on the survey, awareness of constitutional principles will increase. Now, the second part um, of the question, I think it related to other adult um, learning programs. So just from the top of my head, I do believe that they do have a role to play. I think one of the issues that I mentioned or one of the ways in which um, uh, um, we can involve pupils in this education curriculum that I speak of is to have after school curriculums. So this is where we can see individuals involved in adult learning programs um, being paired up with people, for example, in after school programs, exposing them to practical dilemmas outside the classroom. So I do believe that they do have a role um, to play. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munyai. And I think your, your issue about um, awareness and education, especially to those in poverty is very important because how can you access justice if you don't know what your rights are? So obviously we're trying to now promote education and awareness to those disadvantaged communities so that they can actually access, well, as uh, Prof. Bhakti said, access is a very complicated uh, notion, but they are aware of their rights and then they can know what they do thereafter with those rights. Um, Prof. Priyal, I had a private message sent to me, um, a question for you. You talked about um, clinical teaching and, and making teaching more practical. So the question asked is, do we need our academics to be more practical? In other words, to have some sort of um, a professional background other than just being a, an academic, you know, coming straight from their degree and becoming academics. Do you think our academics need to be well-rounded and um, have some sort of professional uh, experience in industry before they come in and become academics? Well, it's a very interesting question. And this is what we have been struggling so far that how do we, when we talk about blending theory to practice, uh, you know, it's so, uh, uh, so, the, I mean, at times it's so frustrating to see to it that most of our academic uh, uh, scholars, you know, who join the teaching universities, they do not have a practical exposure. They generally do uh, our masters and then probably complete uh, their PhD program, which is again a purely an academic and research degree, and they join the institutions. And, and it is being expected uh, from all these uh, young teachers to uh, to to offer a kind of a teaching or to to adopt a pedagogy which ultimately lead to a practical skills so which is at times uh, too much to expect uh, from them so I do believe and I do feel that some kind of a professional experiences in the field really help the students I mean really help the teachers to be more grounded to have a, a very holistic experience and before they join the academia if they have some kind of a compulsory uh, practical experiences if we can um, if we can have then probably uh, it would be really uh, fair for the students to have a better understanding of the practical nuances so yes it's a, it's a it's it's something which we really uh, we have been discussing and deliberating in number of uh, um, events and conferences and seminars that you know how do we imbibe the practical skills you know even the teachers themselves may not have a lot of exposure of uh, the practical understanding of the application of law. Uh, so eventually at times it may happen that uh, over a period of time, the fresh academicians do get this kind of an experience when they, they are they're already there, the part of the academics. And then over a period of time, maybe 10 years, 15 years, 
during that, uh, you know, they also gain an experience. But uh, then uh, once you have uh, uh, academicians who have uh, professional experiences, and then if they join the academic institution, probably they are going to make a huge difference. And this is something which we all expect. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Priyal. I agree with you fully. I think um, you raise important points. Unfortunately, we have been running out of time now, so we're going to wrap up. Um, Dr. Fanek, if I could ask you to please reply to Ms. Finn and uh, Dr. Gunnerberg offline to their questions, if possible. And Arpit, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Sirship. And uh, undoubtedly, we are running out of time. And at the same point of time, it is our willingness to go ahead, but somehow because of uh, time paucity. So I, I just... Uh, um, uh, in, um, I just uh, handed over to Professor Varsha to give a vote of thanks. And before that, let me introduce uh, Professor Ganguly to all of us. Professor Ganguly is a professor at uh, Institute of Law, Nirma University. She worked with two premium institutions, Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration, Mysore, and with the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, as a professor and a fellow, respectively. Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Varsha Ganguly actively engaged herself into a versatile use of research, teaching, publication, and enhancing a uh, cycle of social knowledge and social transformation. And pupils' knowledge based upon public, police, uh, public policy are the main area of work. She published uh, widely on land rights, land questions, uh, citizens' rights, collective action, and on marginalized groups in India from the perspective of social justice and has been an editor of three academic journals. So I hand it over to uh, Professor Ganguly to give a word of thanks. Uh, you are on mute, ma'am. Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, handing over for vote of thanks. And, uh, 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 you know, we have uh, touched upon many pertinent issues in the session. And uh, many of us wanted it to go ahead uh, and continue the session, but uh, I'm taking this uh, uh, opportunity to thank all of you. Um, especially, uh, I would uh, like to thank every speaker and discussion discussions for the session. Uh, personally, Professor uh, uh, Upendra Bakshi, Professor Pudhi Pokharyal, Dr. Uh, Anjani Munyai, Dr. Michelle Venak, uh, uh, and uh, Sarshiv Reddy and Arpit Sharma as discussants. I also would like to thank uh, Arpit Sharma and Megan Finn, who, are, who have uh, uh, relentlessly worked as theme coordinators for and ensuring that this session goes uh, smoothly and uh, you know we are able to reach out uh, uh, through this seminar as effectively as we can. Um, I'm also thankful to Assistant Registrar Institute of Law, Nirmai University, Mr. Gagandeep Singh Khanduja, for performing all the necessary administrative tasks, ensuring smooth operations and running of the webinar and the documentation of, it, of the same. Uh, special thanks to Technical Assistant Team of Institute of Law, Nirma, uh, for small, smooth operations. Um, thanks to Dr. Vikas Trivedi uh, from Nirma University, ILNU, uh, for media and social media coverage, pre and post event, and uh, providing all sorts of media related support. All the colleagues of uh, Institute of Law, Nirma University, and Faculty of Law, University of Johannesburg, and all the participants for uh, making this uh, session very live with active participation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bakshi. I'm going to see you all. Yes. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. You. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.